Uh, hello there. Uh, welcome to our video presentation on adversarial mix-up resynthesis. Uh, this was recently accepted into Europe's 2019 as a conference poster. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Okay, to start off, um, adversarial mix-up resynthesis, uh, which we'll just call uh, AMR, that's the abbreviation, uh, is basically a technique to improve representations known by autoencoders. Uh, autoencoders being uh, one of the most fundamental building blocks uh, that we have in unsupervised learning. Uh, so just to give an example, um, in an autoencoder, we, you know, we have our input X. Uh, it could be an image, it could be text, whatever. Uh, and then we're going to run it through an encoding function, F, uh, to produce a, a representation here. Uh, now commonly, this representation uh, is going to be much smaller in dimensionality than X, because here we want to you know, capture the most salient features, the most important features, uh, to basically reconstruct X. Uh, and we reconstruct it by having a decoder function g, uh, which puts it back uh, into uh, the original space. So x tilde here uh, denotes the reconstruction of x. And so we're basically um, training this. We're going to update its parameters so as to minimize the reconstruction loss, which is the L2 norm between x and x tilde, uh, which in this case would just be x minus the decoder of the encoder of x, uh, like so. Uh, so in deep learning, uh, in general, not just in unsupervised learning, uh, data augmentation is actually an extremely useful thing to do. Um, and in the case of images, it's really easy to do, right? Uh, so you know, the reason why we're doing this is you, you can think about it as like you're trying to artificially augment uh, your training set, which is usually quite small in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and so, for instance, we have uh, you know, a bunch of images here, uh, you know, these five images, and we can perform various transformations, like you know, maybe we can randomly rotate the image, we can blur it a bit, uh, we can play up the contrast, uh, and vice versa. And so, and, uh, for instance, if you were training a classifier to classify these images, then you'd be making the classifier a lot more robust. Um, you know, it would see you know, d this image in different lighting conditions or different angles. And so just in general, it's a really good idea to do, and it's really effective. Um, another example is actually this thing called a denoising autoencoder. Uh, so here we're, we're, we're dealing with endless digits, uh, and we can see this 2 has been corrupted with noise. And so the idea is that if it's being corrupted with this sort of noise, we can run it through the encoder, and it's actually going to produce the original image. And so what we're doing is that we're training this autoencoder to, to learn to separate signal from noise. Uh, and so the objective that we'd be minimizing here would actually be this uh, the L2 norm between x and uh, g of x of f plus epsilon, where epsilon is this noise. So for instance, this could be sampled from a, a Gaussian. And so each pixel would have an epsilon sampled from it. Uh, so this is called the, uh, the denoising autoencoder, and it's much more robust than the one uh, that we explained in the previous slide. Uh, so here we're going to talk about another data augmentation algorithm called uh, Mixup, uh, which was proposed by uh, Zhang Yital in 2017. Our technique actually uses a form of this, but just for the sake of this slide, we're going to explain the original algorithm uh, in the context of supervised learning. Um, and so Mixup is actually really simple. Uh, it's only a few lines of code, really. Um, basically, what we're going to do is that we're going to construct uh, random convex combinations uh, b between random pairs of examples and their labels in the data set. Uh, so for instance, imagine we're you know, looping through, let's just say, uh, you know, D1 and D2, where these are the same training set, but they uh, have different orderings. They're shuffled differently. You know, we could say, you know, for uh, X, I, uh, Y, I, and uh, X, J, Y, J in uh, D1, D2. Um, we're going to construct this x mix uh, to be alpha times xi plus 1 minus alpha times xj, um, where alpha, let's say, is going to be sampled from, uh, let's say, sorry, a uniform distribution. And uh, y mix uh, is the same thing. It's going to be alpha times yi plus 1 minus alpha times yj. Um, and now we have this new pseudo example here, x mix. Uh, y mix, and we're going to train our classifier on that. Um, so what does this do? Um, well, 
oops, sorry, the text is above the diagram, but uh, you know, here's, a, here's an example here. So um, you know, if we look at this diagram, we have these two classes. We have uh, orange as one class, and green is the other class. And blue, this blue shading here is the probability that y equals one. Uh, so we can see that uh, you know it's not so smooth. It's it's a pretty you know, sharp decision boundary. Uh, but when we do mix up, we get something that's uh, a lot smoother uh, in this region here. Uh, so here's an example here. Uh, we're using uh, some 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 random images from CFAR10. Uh, and so if we just look at the top row for now, we have this uh, this truck X1 and we have this dare X2. And you know, as we're moving from uh, from left to right, we're, we're, we're sort of traversing that convex combination. So for instance, you know, the second image here would be something like, you know, let's just say 0.9 of X1 and 0.1 of X2. And this would be the opposite. This would be like 0.1 of X1 and 0.9 of X2. And in the middle, this would be about 50-50. So we can see here what we can see here is this you know this assumption that we're making that when we you know interpolate between you know these these, these images in pixel space that we're also going to interpolate their probabilities right so you know, this this would have a class of let's just say there are only two classes right this would be one and zero the one hot vector and this would be uh, zero and one and what we're saying is that this class here would would be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. So the classifier is going to say, well, you know, uh, I'm half confident that it's a truck and I'm half confident that it's a dare. Um, but, you know, there are some problems. Um, the main one is that, you know, these interpol interpolations, they don't really look like they're representative of the training set. Uh, so you could easily have a case of underfitting. Um, but they're also not really uh, semantically meaningful. Um, you know, if we were interpolating between two cars, for example, um, we wouldn't, expect to see some you know, just novel combination that looks realistic. It would just be these two cars that have been you know, halfway faded. Um, so it's not semantic mixing, it's just mixing in pixel space. Um, but to address this issue, um, recently we proposed a paper called uh, Manifold uh, Mixup. This is actually from uh, Verma et al which is recently accepted into ICML. Um, and this basically does the mixing in the hidden space of a classifier. So now you have these uh, semantic mixes. Um, AMR does something similar, but uh, in the case of unsupervised learning. And so we'll get to that really soon. Uh, so our technique, uh, which we'll get to quite shortly, uh, can be motivated uh, in part, at least by a statistical you know, way of looking at the problem. And so you know, we have these faces here. Um, you know, we can imagine there being this complicated function p of x, and so you know these x's are samples from p of x. Um, and in unsupervised learning, what we're really interested in is is this inference function p of z given x, right? Uh, you know, what are the latent variables which uh, explain or or generate this data x? So in the cases of faces, let's just say you know we might have a lot of these latent variables z1, z2, up to let's just say zm. You know, there may be a lot of these. Um, and they all you know, come together uh, and basically uh, influence or generate uh, X. So you know, for instance, uh, this could be something like you know, hair color, you know, skin color, age, uh, eye color, and vice versa. Um, now let's just say, for example, that you know, M was 32. Well, you know, if these were all binary variables, or you know, 2 to the power of M, be 2 to the power of 32, which would be you know, 4.2 billion, uh, which is a very large number, a very large uh, configuration space of these variables. And you know, most likely, uh, we're not going to have 4.2 billion images. And even so, um, there's going to be a lot of redundancy. Um, so we can see that you know, there are a lot of uh, possible configurations of these latent variables uh, to generate this x. Uh, so just as an example, you know, suppose you know we train an autoencoder, uh, and let's just say this lady here is x1 and this guy is x2, and you know, we're going to encode uh, both of these images uh, with the encoder function, and you can imagine the autoencoder um, having extracted, having learned some of these these latent factors, uh, and let's just say, for example, it just so happens to be that in our training set we've got no guys with red hair. But we have women with red hair. 
or you know, depending on how we combine these latent, uh, these how we mix these latent variables, we might end up getting the same guy uh, with orange here. So we can produce configurations of latent variables uh, as a form of data augmentation, configurations of latent variables which may not be initially present in our training set. And really that's the whole idea uh, behind AMR. Okay, so just to explain that again, uh, just uh, in a better slide, uh, we have these two, these two images here, x1 and x2, uh, and we're training an autoencoder, and so you know we're going to encode uh, using this encoding function, uh, some representation here, uh, h1, and we also have x2, which we're going to encode into some latent representation, h2. Um, now, because this is an order encoder, right? I mean, we're going to we're going to, you know, still do the uh, the reconstruction. So this would be x1 tilde, and we're minimizing this L2 norm here. And same thing for x2, and its uh, and its reconstruction here, right? And we have this norm. Um, okay, so the mixing happens at h1 and h2, right? So we're going to feed both of these through some uh, mixing function. Um, and it's going to produce some mix between H1 and H2, and it's going to output uh, some H mix. Uh, and then we're going to decode this mix with G and get some X mix. Now, if you do this with, say, a regular order encoder, it's not guaranteed that this, this mix here is going to look realistic. Um, it could be something that's completely gibberish. Um, but what we're doing, um, in, in order uh, for this algorithm to work, we're actually going to use generative adversarial networks. Um, I won't go into it you know, too much, um, but basically you know, what we do is, let me just select a different color. Um, and we have this, uh, this discriminator function here, um, and basically it's going to, this discriminator is trained to say that this is fake, and that you know, these, uh, these two images here are real. And the autoencoder is going to try to fool this discriminator. So basically, it's going to try to it's going to update its parameters so as uh, to produce mixes uh, that could plausibly look like they come from the data distribution. Okay, so uh, what is this mixing function? Uh, well, the first one that comes to mind would just be uh, mixup. I'm just putting it in quotes to say you know this is this is the original mixup. Uh, you know, using the original paper. Uh, used in manifold mixup and also in some related work. Um, so let's just say here this is you know this is H1. Uh, so this is basically an encoding of X1. It's a bunch of feature maps. So we have four feature maps, uh, and we also have you know H2, uh, which is the encoding of X2. Um, also a bunch of feature maps. Uh, so what we can say is that well we could sample some you know scalar alpha from say some uniform distribution. And just literally multiply uh, produces this combination. So alpha times h1 plus one minus alpha times this, uh, and then we get some some combination here h mix, uh, which we then uh, decode uh, into some x mix. Uh, so another one uh, that actually we propose that's specific to our work is this thing called Bernoulli mixer in which we do discrete mixes. Uh, so to explain this, uh, again, we have the, you know, just H1 and H2. And um, just for just to present a bit, I'm just flattening these out, uh, these feature maps. Uh, and so what we're doing is that we're actually going, going to sample from a Bernoulli distribution. Um, so for each, uh, you know, for each index, because there are four feature maps, we're going to sample some, uh, let's just say, some M uh, from some Bernoulli distribution uh, parameterized by P. Uh, and this could be you know, 0.5, for example. Um, and so maybe for the first one, uh, you know, it, it samples zero. And then maybe for this one, when we sample that M, we're going to get zero. And maybe for this one, we get one. And maybe for this one, we get one. Uh, so what that means is that um, because these are zero, we're going to retain these feature maps. And because these are one, we're going to retain these feature maps. Um, and then we're going to do this discrete swapping. So we have the first two feature maps of this guy and the last two feature maps of this guy. Um, and again, we're going to basically decode that uh, 
uh, into an X mix, um, so discrete mixing. Um, in the uh, in the previous two examples, we were just mixing uh, two examples at a time. But you know, one question you might ask is, you know, can we mix uh, between multiple examples? Can we mix between three examples, four examples, and vice versa? Uh, and absolutely. Um, so if we just go back to the case, uh, let's say we're k equals two, uh, where we're mixing with two examples. Um, you know, really, you know, we have these two mixing coefficients, uh, you know, alpha one and alpha two. Um, but really, we only need one alpha, right? Because alpha 1 is just alpha, and alpha 2 is just 1 minus alpha. Um, but we can visualize this as like a line segment, right? So you know, here would be alpha 1, and you know, this would be 1, 0, and here's alpha 2 with 0 and 1, and you know, we can sort of draw a line segment between them. And so this halfway point would be you know, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. And so, you know, we can imagine, you know, drawing these alphas from this line segment. Um, now, in the case of k equals 3, uh, you know, we have alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. And, you know, we have this constraint that, um, you know, these alphas have to sum to 1. Um, and again, you know, we can sort of draw, uh, let's say, the corners of, of, of this, this vector. So this one here would be uh, 1, 0, 0. For alpha 1 equals 1, alpha 2 equals 0, alpha 3 equals 0. This is another corner, 0, 1, 0. And this is another corner, 0, 0, 1. Right? Uh, and so this actually forms a triangle. Um, and so this midpoint here would be, yeah, you know, 0.33, uh, 0.33. Um, and so, you know, we're drawing um, uh, these alphas from this triangle. Um, so, by the way, this is called a 1 uh, simplex. Uh, and this is called a, a two simplex, right? Um, and you can generalize this to uh, kind of more dimensions. So in k equals four, you know, it would be something like a, a tetrahedron. Okay, just to uh, give some some animations to sort of illustrate the point. Um, you know, in this case, we have a mix up of k equals two, and so you can imagine this being like a three dimensional latent space, and you know, red. Uh, these are the real points. Uh, latent states from real examples, and you know, these blue uh, dots are the interpolations. Uh, so we can see that you know, we're taking random pairs of these real points and interpolating uh, along uh, their lines. Uh, this is mixed up with k equals 3. Uh, same thing now, but we're actually taking random triplets. Um, so here's a, you know, these, these three real examples, and we're interpolating uh, between them. We're interpolating uh, in their triangle. Um, here's Bernoulli mix-up for, for k equals 2. Um, this is a bit less intuitive visually, but uh, you, know, you can also see the type of interpolation uh, that's imposed by doing this Bernoulli mixing. Um, it's also useful to talk about some uh, related work. There are actually two papers uh, that are very similar in nature. Um, uh, adversarially constrained autoencoder interpolation, uh, which we'll call ACI, which is uh, recently published in ICLEAR 2019, and uh, generative adversarial interpolative autoencoding, uh, otherwise known as GAIA. Um, and so there are some differences uh, between the works. Uh, in ACI, um, what's going on is that uh, so they're using mixup uh, in the K equals 2 case. Um, but when the discriminator gets that uh, gets that x mix, the discriminator is actually going to try to predict the mixing coefficient alpha, uh, right? So it wants to predict, uh, you know, to what extent, um, to what extent, let's just say x1, h1 was mixed, and what extent h2 was mixed. And so the order encoder's objective is to try to make the discriminator think that uh, that the mixing coefficient for x mix is either zero or one. Um, and so the output of this discriminator is tied to the mixing function that's used. Um, but in that case, they only try uh, mix up uh, with k equals 2. Um, in Gaia, um, they use a mixing function, which is based on a Gaussian. So if we have h1 and h2, we're actually going to sample an h mix uh, from a Gaussian distribution, uh, which is just the, uh, the midpoint of h1 and h2 with some variant sigma squared. Uh, so, you know, if H1 was here and H2 was here, we're basically sampling uh, this Gaussian, uh, which is at the midpoint. So you're more likely to sample uh, interpolations that are, you know, really in the middle of these two points. Um, but again, uh, it's in the K equals 2 case. 
Uh, in particular, what we're interested in is just mixing functions in general, just evaluating um, you know, uh, different types of mixing functions like Bernoulli mixer, mix up for k greater than two, and just really you know, think about um, you know, what these specific mixing functions are actually doing and, and what their implications are on uh, the resulting representation. Uh, so here I'm just showing some uh, qualitative results, uh, finally. Um, this is on the Zappos uh, shoe data set. Um, so you know, we have uh, one type of shoe here, x1, we have another type of shoe here, x2, and this, uh, this row is basic pixel space interpolation. This one is just a regular autoencoder, uh, interpolating in the latent space of a regular autoencoder, sorry. Uh, this is uh, AKI, and this is AMR. Uh, so we can see that for these top two, you know, there's a lot of ghosting in these interpolations. It doesn't uh, look very realistic. Uh, same thing for uh, the autoencoder, um, but for AKI and AMR, you know, things uh, look a lot better, um, especially in this case for our technique. Um, you know, there's not really much ghosting going on. Um, and again, this is due to the fact that you know, any interpolations produced by the autoencoder um, have to look realistic. They have to fool the discriminator. Um, so it's going to want to get rid of the, this ghosting because that ghosting isn't present in the original data set. Um, uh, also, this is just for uh, k equals 2 uh, with just a uh, regular mix-up. Uh, so here's another example, a more high-res version. Uh, this is actually uh, the first figure in the paper. Uh, yeah, we have this uh, x1 here and we have this x2 here. So you know, these are kind of like two completely different shoes. This is a, a wedge sandal and this is a boot. Uh, and we're doing these interpolations. Um, but what you will notice in some of the figures is that um, sometimes it can seem like the, you know, the, the jump, it's, it's a pretty big jump between these interpolations. Uh, and this seems to be, uh, at least in part, the consequence of, of doing this whole adversarial thing. Uh, so just to elaborate, let's just suppose that you know, we have this space here and you know, H1 lies here and H2 lies here. And you know, we're gonna do uh, an interpolation right in the middle um, and let's just say, you know, we, we decode it into some X mix. Uh, you know, we might find that when we re-encode it, um, I'm just going to draw the same diagram again. Uh, it might be sort of, let's say, more closer to one of the original H's. Um, so it's kind of, you know, analogous to this denoising effect, right? Like these shoes are, are completely different um, and maybe it can't seem to, you know, produce something that's really in between the two shoes. And so it pushes it. Uh, in your in either direction. Um, so again, this seems to be a natural consequence of, of just you know, doing this adversarial game. Um, but in order to, to, to actually, if you wanted to mitigate this, you could do something which is called a consistency loss. Um, I won't go into it for this video, but uh, you can read a bit about it in, in the appendix of the paper. Uh, so here, uh, here's an example of uh, some, some interpolations with a Bernoulli mix-up. And so what we're doing um, is doing a discrete mixing between feature maps. Uh, so for example, uh, well, let's just say this is x1, or well, it's encoding as h1, and this guy's encoding as h2. Well, let's just say for this one, you know, we want to keep most of the feature maps from this guy, and, and we want a few feature maps from this guy. So we might say, oh, I'm going to sample uh, a vector, a mask vector, uh, from a Bernoulli, and let's just make it maybe 0.9, right? So this is actually a vector, a binary vector, um, you know, M1, M2, up to, let's just say we have P feature maps, and then the interpolation is simply going to be M times H1 plus uh, 1 minus M times H2, where M is this, uh, this binary mask, for instance. Um, now for here, for example, maybe we want roughly half the feature maps from this guy and roughly half from this guy. Uh, and so, you know, we might sample a Bernoulli mask from something like 0.5. And then we'll do the same thing, m times h1 plus 1 minus m times h2, um, and, and vice versa. And this guy here will have most of his feature maps from this guy uh, and a few from this guy. Uh, so here's another interesting example. This is actually um, a mixing function, uh, which is an MLP that's uh, trained in a supervised manner. Uh, and so let's just, you know, if we look here, for example, we're just considering th three attributes, uh, male, makeup, and lipstick. And so our guy here, Keith Sutherland, uh, you know, his attribute vector is one, zero, zero. 
so yeah, he's male, but he doesn't have makeup and he doesn't have lipstick. Uh, and this lady here, well, her attribute vector is the opposite. It's actually 0, 1, 1. So not male, she's female, but has makeup and has lipstick. Um, and basically, yeah, we learned this mixing function, which is an MLP, which basically um, you condition on, say, uh, a vector like this. So not male, makeup, and lipstick. And it's going to try to figure out what feature maps does it have to uh, take from this guy and this woman in order to produce a mix which satisfies uh, this classification here. Right? And so uh, we do that using an AC GAN, an auxiliary classify GAN, which is just uh, one supervised variant of a GAN. And so not only does this, this mix here have to look realistic, uh, it also has to satisfy this classification here. Uh, and so you can see uh, in this row, um, we're showing you know, different versions of Kiefer Sublin with these different attribute vectors, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, so to actually evaluate these representations, like how, how good they are, we're going to do something that's similar to what they did in the AKI paper, and we're actually going to train linear classifiers on top of these encodings. Uh, so let's just say we, uh, you know, we're training our, our AMR autoencoder, and you know, we encode some X into some H, and you know, and there's also the, the reconstruction, this is the encoder, this is the decoder. Um, we're going to branch, so during training, we have uh, a linear classifier, PY given X, which is branching off this encoding here. Um, and we're actually going to train it to predict the class from H. Um, but what's very important to note is that we're not backpropping uh, the gradients from this back into the autoencoder, right? So this is, this is a cutoff here. So, you know, this autoencoder is trained completely unsupervised. It doesn't see the labels, uh, but this part uh, is trained uh, supervised. Um, and it doesn't have to be a linear classifier per se. It could also be a deep neural network, but it just so happens to be that you know, linear classifiers are fast to train, um, and it really makes a difference when you're training, uh, running hundreds of experiments. Um, and so, you know, we're going to train this, and we're going to evaluate its accuracy uh, on both the validation and test sets. Um, as well as that, uh, each experiment uh, we run, uh, we, we run it three times, so there are three repeats. Um, and so for each of these, uh, these, these trials, uh, we're going to find basically the epoch corresponding to the point at which the validation performance was highest. And then we're going to evaluate that point on the test set. And so basically we're actually, we're going to get you know, three test set numbers, uh, and then we're just going to take the mean and variance of that. And that's what we report. Um, in terms of hyperparameters, um, there's lambda, the reconstruction loss. Um, so this also affects how much weighting you give uh, to the GAN loss because essentially the autoencoder is trying to minimize, uh, let's just say, you know, the loss here would be uh, you know, reconstruction uh, plus this GAN loss, or it'd be lambda times uh, reconstruction plus this GAN loss, uh, where this is the loss that tries to, to fold and discriminate with the mixes. Uh, and so, you know, the higher this lambda is, uh, you know, relatively speaking, the, the less weighting that the GAN loss gets. Uh, so you really have to tune this. Uh, the mixing function, so we uh, explore, you know, just mix up and Bernoulli. Um, unfortunately, due to, you know, time and resource constraints, we couldn't explore this uh, as rigorously. Um, but really, um, we do, you know, have a lot of experiments on, on mix up, which is, which is good. Um, and uh, for that, there's also the, the k value. Uh, so how many examples do we mix between at a time? Do we mix you know, two, three, four, six, eight, and, and vice versa? Okay, so here are uh, our first uh, set of experiments that we ran. We actually uh, ran some experiments on MNIST, uh, KMNIST, and uh, SVHN. Um, and so um, and we also, uh, so this is the, the, the test set performance, uh, and we're also showing the, the, the values of lambda, uh, the best performing lambdas uh, for those experiments. Uh, and so if you look uh, row by row, we, the first one we have is autoencoder plus GAN. So this is just an autoencoder uh, with the GAN on the reconstruction, uh, so there's no mixing. Um, but the reason why we put this on the reconstruction is so that uh, you get nicer, uh, nicer reconstructions, ones that aren't blurry. Um, this is a common problem uh, if you just train a regular autoencoder. Uh, now for AMR, you know, these are the experiments that we ran, so there's mix up with k equals 2, 
Bernoulli of k equals 2 and mix up of k equals 3. Uh, for Akai, we, uh, we did our own implementation of Akai um, as well. And here, just in this little, this little box here, um, we're, showing, uh, we're, we're showing the results from the Akai paper, uh, quoting them directly. Uh, so for MNIST, Akai actually performs, uh, our implementation of Akai actually performs the best. Um, same thing for KMNIST, um, but fortunately, I guess, um, for SVHN, a slightly more complicated data set, we actually achieve a big win here uh, with actually 47.34 uh, compared to, uh, say, um, you know, the baseline, which is 37, uh, our uh, implementation of Akai, which is 34, and theirs, which is 34 and we actually get this with uh, k equals 3, uh, which is nice. Uh, so for our second set of experiments, we actually did uh, an ablation. So we're just looking at SVHN. Um, the, the encoding size is still 32, but what we're doing is that we're basically reducing the size of the training set. So in this case, for example, we've taken a thousand, uh, randomly selected a thousand examples in the training set and decided to use that as the training set. If for here we randomly selected 5,000 and decided to use that, and vice versa for 10,000 and 20,000. And this is really just to see um, you know, what the behavior of these algorithms are in the, in the sort of low data regime. Um, so if we look at 1K, uh, the lowest, well, okay, Akai here uh, performs best. Uh, for 5K, um, you know, we you know, perform the best here, but actually, you know, because of this, this low data regime we're operating in, you know, this is a pretty high variance, uh, whereas Akai here actually performs only slightly less, but with a much lower variance. Um, for 10,000, uh, we achieved the best result uh, for mix up k equals 3 uh, with a reasonable variance. Um, and here for 20k, uh, we achieved 37, although the variance here is a bit big as well. Um, but you know, things in general do look uh, pretty good for mix up k equals 3. Uh, so here are some more results, um, again on SVHN, but now we also have CIFAR-10. Um, here the encoding size now is actually 256, um, so this actually corresponds to 16 feature maps now, um, with basically a 4x4 four four spatial dimension, so that's 256. Um, and this is really just to see um, you know, what results we get uh, you know, when we beef up that, the, the size of that encoding. Uh, for 1024, uh, we're actually using 64 feature maps of 4x4, so that would be 1024. Um, and so, you know, here we actually explore what happens when you when you go beyond uh, k equals 3. So, you know, we have 4, 6, and 8. Um, and so if we look at SVHN with, with, with the 256 uh, size encoding, um, we actually get a pretty impressive 75.71 uh, for k equals 8. Um, but actually the quoted ACOI result is 85.14, um, which is really impressive. Um, so I'm not really sure uh, what the reason for that difference is. Uh, it may be the case that we needed to run our experiments for longer, um, but you know, uh, time and resource constraints. Um, for uh, CIFAR 10, for 256, we, uh, you know, we achieved the best result here, 54.94 uh, uh, with k equals 3, and uh, for CIFAR 10, uh, for the big bottom, uh, bottleneck dimension, uh, 1024, we get 61.72 uh, with k equals 4. Um, as you can see, it's not always the case that a higher k uh, corresponds to a better accuracy. Um, this is something that needs to be looked at uh, in more detail. Uh, maybe there are some theoretical things you can say about uh, the choice of k. Um, but you know, either way, um, there will be a brief discussion on this in the appendix if you want to know more about it. Uh, lastly, we evaluate our algorithm in the context of uh, disentanglement. So there's this uh, data set called dSprite. Um, it's basically just this one uh, sprite which can take on uh, various positions, rotations, shapes, um, and it's basically used uh, in the context of measuring disentanglement. Um, so if we look at the, the ground truth latent factors of this data set, you have, um, you have six. Well, really it's five because the only color you have is white, but you have these five uh, latent variables, uh, the shape of the sprite, the scale, uh, the orientation, the x position, the y position, and they all take on uh, various ranges of values. Uh, and so if you take all possible latent configurations, uh, you get this data set here. And so this animation is just showing uh, 
you know, all the possible configurations. Um, and so, for instance, you know, we might want to try to recover these latent uh, factors in an unsupervised manner. And so what we could do is say, well, you know, if we could train this autoencoder um, and maybe this autoencoder will, uh, let's just say it's a five dimension, um, we want you know, each of these units to encode uh, the latent factors like shape, uh, scale, um, you know, orientation, uh, X position and Y position. Um, but we also want it to encode these latent factors such that there's disentanglement. So, you know, if you're only going to change uh, X, for example, it shouldn't change anything else. Um, or if you're going to change scale, if you're going to vary this dimension, it shouldn't change anything else when you decode um, into the, uh, the image. Um, and so there are, there are two... Uh, two metrics that were proposed recently uh, to measure this, this disentanglement and one is uh, in the beta, uh, the beta VAE paper um, but an improved version of that metric was proposed uh, in factor VAE and so we use this uh, in our evaluation. Um, so if we look at uh, our table of results uh, this accuracy is this disentanglement metric um, and we have uh, a beta VAE, uh, just a you know, finely tuned baseline uh, we have our autoencoder, uh, we have AMR, uh, and so actually uh, the, the finely tuned VAE, the beta VAE, actually performs the best with a disentanglement uh, accuracy of 68%. Um, for us, um, it turns out that Bernoulli with K equals 3 uh, actually uh, performed the second best, uh, followed by Bernoulli with K equals 2, um, which is interesting. Um, so maybe, um, you know, there is something interesting about uh, using Bernoulli mix-up in the context of, of, of disentanglement. Um, again, uh, this really requires further exploration. It would be good to know better um, you know, what some of the implications are of, of using, uh, say, regular mix-up uh, versus Bernoulli, and also what happens when you uh, play with the value of K. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we perform an exploration of mix-up in the context of unsupervised learning. And so one of the motivating reasons was this idea that uh, we can imagine the encoding of our autoencoder uh, trying to learn uh, these latent factors uh, that represent the data and that we can generate novel combinations of these by performing mixing uh, and then making these uh, novel mixes look realistic uh, through an adversarial uh, GAN framework. Uh, and so we looked at it in the context of the mixing function, so we tried different functions like uh, mixup, uh, Bernoulli, uh, supervised Bernoulli. Uh, so this is the example where we did attribute swapping uh, for celebrity faces uh, and also mixing with K greater than 2. Uh, qualitatively uh, compared to uh, to our baselines we achieved more real realistic interpolations. Um, quantitatively we found that uh, mix up greater than 2 generally performs uh, really well, uh, performs the best. Um, yeah, this was for the, the tasks uh, where we uh, branched a linear classifier off the encoding and tried to uh, predict the class. Um, unfortunately, due to time and resource constraints, we weren't able to explore Bernoulli mix-up as rigorously, but uh, at the same time, we found some evidence that it might be useful uh, in the context of disentanglement, uh, the results that we presented on the dsprite data set. Um, for future work, uh, it'd be nicer to, to have a better theoretical understanding of these mixing functions, a better uh, theoretical framework, um, and also maybe looking at mix-up from a more biological uh, point of view. It is interesting to note that, uh, well, if we look at, say, Bernoulli mix-up, uh, this could be seen as being somewhat analogous to biological crossover, in which you're swapping, um, swapping over different uh, segments of DNA. Um, and also what's interesting is that recently uh, genetic algorithms have uh, become um, sort of more widely used in deep reinforcement learning uh, under this, this idea called evolutionary strategies uh, as an alternate, uh, alternative way to train uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, so there might be something interesting to see uh, from this point of view. Uh, well, thank you for uh, watching this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or whatever, you can email me at this address or uh, tweet me. Uh, I'll put the link to the, uh, the code and the uh, paper below so that you can look at them easily. Um, and again, thank you very much for watching.